This episode is brought to you by The Fifth Vital Sign. Master your cycles and optimize your fertility. With over 1,000 research citations, it is the most comprehensive resource on fertility awareness and the menstrual cycle to date. The Fifth Vital Sign is available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook formats on Amazon.com. Listen to The Fifth Vital Sign for free when you sign up for a 30-day trial with Audible. Visit fertilityfriday.com slash audible for details. That's fertilityfriday.com slash audible. This is the Fertility Friday Podcast, episode number 422. Welcome to the Fertility Friday Podcast, your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I'm your host, Lisa Hendrickson-Jack. I'm the author of The Fifth Vital Sign and the Fertility Awareness Mastery Charting Journal. I'm a certified fertility awareness educator and holistic reproductive health practitioner with nearly 20 years of experience teaching women to connect to their fifth vital sign through menstrual cycle charting, balancing hormonal health, and optimizing the menstrual cycle without hormones. I'm outspoken about hormonal birth control and its impact on fertility and overall health because you have the right to know how your body works and how artificial hormones disrupt that natural process. I teach women's health professionals how to utilize the menstrual cycle as a vital sign in their practices, and I host live coaching programs to help you achieve optimal fertility and health because it's important to have healthy menstrual cycles regardless of whether or not you want to have babies. I'm also a wife and mother of two beautiful boys. I know, I'm a busy girl, but I managed to fit it all in. This podcast is designed to empower you to take full control of your cycles, your fertility, and your overall health. And I'm so excited that you're here with me today. Today, I'm sharing an important, powerful, and informative episode all about endometriosis. I'm sharing my episode with Jessica Drummond, and in today's episode, she defines endometriosis, talks about how to get a firm diagnosis, some of the challenges in doing that, some of the options for treatment, how surgery can come into play and when that might be a good option and what some of the limitations might be for that. Uh, So a really great episode to follow up last week's episode about overcoming period pain as well as the week before when Stasha shared her story about endometriosis. We also touch on autoimmunity and the role that it plays in endometriosis. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into today's episode with Jessica. And I'm really excited to be here today with Jessica Drummond. She was a past guest on the show. I think it was like 200 episodes ago or something. (laughs) But I'm thrilled to have her back. So I'll just read uh, her bio real quick in case you're not familiar. So Dr. Jessica Drummond is the CEO of the Integrative Women's Health Institute and author of Outsmart Endometriosis. She holds licenses in physical therapy and clinical nutrition and is born and is a board certified health coach. She has 20 years of experience working with women with chronic pelvic pain, facilitates educational programs for women's health professionals in more than 60 countries globally, and leads virtual wellness programs for people with endometriosis. And so obviously, (laughs) Dr. Drummond has been really busy and is clearly passionate about women's health. So without further ado, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. Well, I'm thrilled to have you back. I think that I saw, uh, was it a live or something that you did with Nicole Jardim recently? And I just felt compelled to reach out because it just so resonated with me what you were talking about with respect to the way our medical system fails to treat women's pelvic pain issues. So (laughs) this is what we're here to, to kind of talk about. And so you probably know just a little bit like about my experience or if not, maybe the listeners, but I had severe period pain for since day one and then into my early twenties. And, you know, that has, I've since been able to overcome that, but just it being in the public realm and so many women reach out whenever I talk about period pain, and I'm sure you get this all the time, millions of women, when you say things like there's period pain is an indication of a problem. And although it's common, it's not normal. Millions of women hear that. And they're like, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. (laughs) Uh, So maybe let's start there. Maybe share with us a little bit about what drew drew you to this work and then let's just get into it. Yeah. So my path to this was 
not not the usual story in the sense that I didn't personally struggle with period pain as a as a young teenager or anything like that. I started as a physical therapist in orthopedics. I was an athlete, so I didn't even get my period till too late, knowing what I know now. I essentially had primary amenorrhea from training 20 hours a week from ages nine to 17, um, sometimes longer. And so then I went to graduate school as a physical therapist. I started in sports medicine and orthopedics and began to specialize in women's health, which in, from a physical therapy standpoint, that essentially means orthopedics of related to women's health conditions, like people who have shoulder pain related to a breast cancer surgery, or people with back pain related to pregnancy, or people with urinary incontinence or prolapse or pelvic pain. So you're doing kind of a, a structural assessment. Is the alignment off? Are there tight muscles? And pelvic pain can be muscular because there's a whole system of muscles of the pelvic floor which connect to the muscles and joints of the and nervous system of the spine and the hips and the abdomen. So if you have a C-section, for example, there's a large incision that is not without consequence, right? There's a structural consequence to having an open abdominal surgery that is pretty undervalued in our medical system. You have a C-section, then they just send you home with a baby. There's no rehab, right? Imagine if you know a, a pro football player had a knee surgery, an open knee surgery, and was just sent home with a baby, no rehab, right? That'd be crazy. So I've been told, like, just don't lift anything heavy, if that. If there's any, right. <laughs> if there's, like, if there's any instructions, like that's it. Maybe sometimes. <laughs> yeah, but by the way, take this baby back yeah. in a forty-pound like car seat yeah. to the but doctor don't in two it. weeks, right? <laughs> don't. A hundred percent. So that's kind of how I got into this. And then after the birth of my first daughter, I had a hormonal crash, which knowing what I know now is likely related to a reactivation of Epstein Barr virus postpartum. Postpartum is a vulnerable time for activation of autoimmune diseases and viral reactivations. I think that's also underappreciated. So that's how I started to study nutrition, functional nutrition, functional medicine, lifestyle medicine. I learned at that point, you know, your first baby is a great teacher of how your relationship to stress and work and overwork is because you suddenly have no extra bandwidth. Well, so, and I would add your relationship to the modern world. Yeah. Because, so not to go on like a super tangent, but it can be an existential crisis to realize that all of a sudden now that you have this baby, you don't really fit into this paradigm that you worked so hard to fit into. Yeah. Yeah. And I even worked at that time at a, at a maternity hospital, quite literally a women's hospital. So that's where I began to kind of integrate functional me medicine perspectives, lifestyle medicine perspectives with physical therapy perspectives to treat complex pelvic pain conditions, endometriosis, vulvodynia, bladder pain, period pain, because our tools in physical therapy were valuable, but not always helping us get complete either relief or root cause relief. And adding kind of that biochemical approach and lifestyle approach and mindset approach helped me to have a wider lens and more tools for my patients who would plateau with pelvic pain. So that's sort of how I landed on really specializing in an integrative approach to pelvic pain, which my oldest is 16 now. So that was a long time ago. Yeah. Well, I think I was thinking about how to approach this topic. And I think like usual, just like, it's like a plane crash into it. So, <laughs> so I released uh, this post on Instagram a while ago, and I think it's still been one of the most contentious. And I, I believe I said something like the pill does not cure or fix anything. <laughs> <laughs> mm, that's, so it's like, tell me what you really think, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what was interesting about that post, so it sparked a lot of, I suppose, to some degree of outrage, a lot of conversation. But I think the, the, the women that came at me the hardest were the ones who experience either, who've experienced either endometriosis and they are aware and it's been diagnosed, or women who've just experienced such severe 
period pain that in their lifetime, the only thing that has ever brought them relief has either been birth control pills or severe pain medication. But I do have to say the caveat that, you know, the pill doesn't fix it for everybody in terms of like reducing the pain. But anyways, so the question out of that then is, I'd love to hear you talk about what exactly is endometriosis and kind of get into the difference between paradigms because there's obviously two paradigms at play here. There's a functional paradigm that's trying to figure out like, what is this? Why is this happening? And also acknowledging that this is not a normal state of the female body to be in severe pain. Mm. And then there's the medical model that kind of says, well, you know, whatever, it's actually fine to be in that kind of pain. We're not going to ask why, but here's how you get rid of the pain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And I think to some extent that's a little bit oversimplified, but it's difficult because you're right. This is a, this is a very hot topic because people have really difficult personal experiences and highly variable for personal experiences, which what, which is what makes it very challenging. So number one, it's a hundred percent not normal to have severe period pain. It's not always caused by endometriosis, but it's a really big index of suspicion, especially if that person has family members, other women, sisters, mothers, aunts, grandma, who had infertility challenges, period pain, because endometriosis does have a genetic component, which actually makes it a little harder to, I believe, to find it early. Because now mothers, you know, the mothers of, that are my age now in our 40s-ish, who have teenagers, you know, 30s, 40s, who have 12 to 15 year olds, whatever, 11 year olds, you know, kids are, do you have period? There's a range of when your period can start, of course, are more aware, but it used to be actually that that was actually a contributor to the problem because it was in the family that 12 year old intense period pain would be normalized because they're like, oh, that's how it is for women in our family. It's just really bad. Take two days off of school, take as much Advil as you need, lay in bed, you know? Or we can mask the pain with birth control, which sometimes works uh, about 30% of the time. It's roughly if we kind of look at the data. That, and so what, what happens is, is that no one's really looking for an answer because the family kind of legacy is that this is what's common normal for our family. And in fact, the number one reason that girls in middle school and high school miss school is for period pain, number one. So mm. even school nurses see this all the time. It's normal. So one thing that I really like, there's a wonderful uh, nonprofit organization called Endo What that produced a movie and they have a school nurse and nurse initiative, which unfortunately it was really kicked off this March and then completely ignored two weeks later because the world fell into a pandemic. So, I mean, it's still going on, but hopefully this will start to pick up more steam again, but they they have a nonprofit program called the school nurse initiative, which aims to begin to educate nurses in elementary, middle school, high schools, because this is where we should be picking this up. It's not normal to have intense period pain, yet within families and even in the media, you know, you see tampon commercials and stuff. Oh, you know, these people like laying in their bed, writhing in pain. None of that is normal. So that's key. And then when we talk about the, well, let's talk about the experience first. So before you talk about the experience, yeah. can I just ask you to clarify? So for the women who are listening who do have pain, so the question is, is there any pain that is normal or how, like what would, where's the line between what you would consider to be normal and problematic? Right. So, I mean, for the most part, you really shouldn't feel your period other than maybe a day, maybe two days of like mild fatigue, a little bit of cramping, go to bed early, take it easy. You should never have to like stay home from school, miss work. It's a, I would call it more of just a shift in your productivity to kind of go back to, to that. And I think that's 
educational for us as humans to be like, this is a time where we take a deep breath, a little extra nourishment, go to bed early, take a nice bath, take a little extra self care. But it most, for the most part, should not be disruptive at all. One day of mild cramping would be the only thing I would even consider quote unquote normal. Well, thank you for clarifying that. I think it's super important to, to make that connection. If for no other reason, then I have to outright ask any woman who I work with exactly like to classify her pain. And I've had women who regularly experience pain that they describe as five or six out of 10. And they're like, yeah, it's totally fine. It's normal. It's always been this way. And I know people who throw up. So this is totally fine for me. And you're just right. like, well, we can aim higher. <laughs> you, you know, you deserve to not be in pain. There's that. Correct. And yeah, it could be worse, but there's no, why walk <laughs> this around with anything. be the bar for life. Like it could be worse. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Although, you know, there's, <laughs> there's some degree of that in everything, I guess. But yes, I, that's how I classify normal. Now, with endometriosis, there's also a broad range of experience. Now, two things. One, period pain is not always endometriosis. There are other things it could be, but it is certainly a big index of suspicion with period pain. And in teenagers, it's actually more common to have acyclical pain. So pain all the time or pain not during the period or pain randomly. So that's also something to be aware of because their cycle hasn't quite regulated yet. So endometriosis pain could be at other times. And the degree of severity, extensiveness of the endometriosis lesions themselves, these lesions of tissue that's similar to the tissue that lines the inside of the uterus, but not exactly the same, growing outside of the uterus. So like outside of ovaries, on outside of the fallopian tubes, on the rectum and the colon and the diaphragm and the knee, it's been found in the nose, you know, it can be anywhere, uh, small intestine, outside of the uterus. These tissue lesions can be pretty extensive with no symptoms or very rare, very light symptoms. They can be less extensive from kind of a what you can see on laparoscopic in a laparoscopic surgery, and or maybe there's just one lesion versus a lot of lesions, and can have severe pain. So the kind of there's not a direct correlation between what the lesions are doing and the symptoms, which I think is really important because there's not an easy classification of what's bad endometriosis, if that makes sense. It does. I have a follow-up question because women talk about when they're diagnosed in different stages. So how does that relate to how it's actually diagnosed? Right. So there are, there is various staging, um, which off the top of my head, I don't remember the surgical staging, like what the criteria are for the various surgical stages. The only way to truly diagnose endometriosis is with a skilled laparoscopic surgery. And in my opinion, done by someone who does pretty much nothing but endometriosis surgery or similar kinds of surgeries all day, every day. It's a specialty skill to be able to find there are different kinds of lesions. They can be very hidden. It can be complex around there being adhesions and the ovary stuck to the wall of the peritoneum. You know, there, it's a complicated surgery if done correctly. Um, and so essentially what the most skilled laparoscopic surgeons who do this work do is they'll go in to essentially make the diagnosis with the expectation. They have a pretty high expectation that they're likely to find it. Occasionally they don't, but usually they do. And then they actually do the surgery right then and there. They actually excise the lesions. So there are two kinds of surgeries ablation surgery, which is sort of the old version, not gold standard, where someone with less skill will kind of, or less experience with this, will go in with a laparoscope, kind of, you're literally like, it's a, it's a kind of 3D um, machine that you go in and look and then just burn off the lesions. That's the ablation versus excision. It's more like removement, removing of a cancerous tumor. You're cutting it out from the root, which is more effective. And ideally you only have one of those surgeries ever. Sometimes you need two or there can be secondary adhesions that someone will go back in. But when I used to treat this starting 25 years ago, 
people would be like, this is my 16th ablation because it would just come back. And fortunately with the surgeons that I work with now, I, I don't really see that. That's, they do one, possibly two good surgeries in a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I have questions about surgery because if you're working with uh, a patient, it's not that they do the surgery and then just don't do anything else. Oh, yes, uh, of course. Yeah. Because, uh, so I, maybe this would be a good time to touch on that. One of the challenges for women with endo, it's, it's still quite common to hear women say that they've had multiple surgeries and that it comes back. And so maybe you could talk about the difference between that and, and also just talk, touch on surgery in and of itself as a treatment. Yeah. So even with great excision surgery, there is a risk of challenges. So, you know, you can have adhesions after the surgery. There can be secondary hernias. The endometriosis can, quote unquote, grow back even in the same area or in other areas that they might not have seen the first time. The humans who do these surgeries are not perfect and these are complicated surgeries. But they're, you know, the people that do them well, just like cancer surgeons, do them pretty well. Now, to your point, you don't just like show up, have surgery, like look around, find the lesions, cut them all out, and you're good because this is a, you know, the lesions are one part of the situation, but when you've been in constant pain for six to 10, 12 years or a lot chronic pain for six to 12 years, which is the average time to diagnosis even now, you, your nervous system has changed. There are inflammatory cytokines locally and throughout your body. Your hormones are, can be out of balance. So there's other stuff. Your pelvic floor muscles are tight. Like imagine if you had an open wound on your shoulder for six to 12 years you'd probably have headaches because you'd be kind of like walking around with your protecting your neck from, you know, having this open wound irritated all day. Right. So there's structural challenges. So ideally, just like with any other surgery, you have about three to six months prior to surgery where you're calming the nervous system. You're on an anti-inflammatory food plan. You're working with the myofascia and nervous system and, and circulatory system of the pelvic floor, other joints. Sometimes people have hip pain and back pain and abdominal pain. You know, you're dealing with all of that to go into surgery as healthy as possible, as resilient as possible from a hormonal standpoint and immune standpoint and digestive standpoint. Because if you imagine digestive system is challenged when there are lesions growing on your colon or in your small intestine, endo belly, a bloating situation is often related to small intestine bacterial overgrowth. So like you want to maximize, kind of improve the health of all these systems before going into surgery, ideally, especially the nervous system, because surgery, as the surgeons will agree in and of itself makes, you know, kind of, irritates the nervous system, right? <laughs> but if you go in with kind of a calmer nervous system, healthier, more resilient nervous system, digestive system, immune system, myofascial system, and then do the same thing after. And the recovery from surgery takes an average of like five weeks to say 12 weeks or something to know like, okay, the surgery is, an, is a success. And the surgery was good, the endo pain is improved, but there are these secondary issues. You know, people might have had chronic yeast infections for years or chronic UTIs or vulvar pain, or as I said, the nervous systems involved, the immune systems involved. They might have been constipated for 12 years. So like we have to deal with all of those secondary sequela that's not exactly the endometriosis lesion, but it's the inflammatory cytokines, it's digestive function, it's pelvic floor relaxation. So if we think of it as instead investing, you know, a few months pre-op and I really, it depends on the complication of the case and there's a lot of other factors, but somewhere between six and 24 months post-op to like really complete root cause healing, it's a much better long-term experience. And I would say one other thing, not every single person needs or wants to have surgery. It's not a, always a requirement. Now, 
surgery done sooner rather than later and, and done at all does improve fertility. So not just pain, but uh, endometriosis is a very common cause of infertility. So people can have silent endometriosis where they have no pain at all, but they don't realize it until they have trouble getting pregnant. So if someone is really concerned about their fertility, I recommend sooner rather than later that they have a consultation to decide whether or not and when they want to have surgery. But I've met clients who have endometri have had endometriosis forever. They've had three kids. Now they're in their forties and have a lot of pain. And so they just might decide not to have surgery. So we still kind of take that multi-system approach because the pain driver, the digestive issue driver, the anxiety driver, the fatigue driver is not always just the lesion. It's all of the secondary factors that go along with having endometriosis. Well, I'm glad that you touched on that. I mean, one of the questions that I was planning to ask is, is surgery required? And so one of the questions that I want to ask you, you know, I've had a number of different practitioners on the show of different modalities, different, essentially pelvic therapy mm -hmm. modalities, Arbigo therapy, fertility massage therapy, Mercy therapy. And I have another episode coming up and I don't remember the exact name of the technology, but it, again, it's a doctor who developed another type of pelvic specific massage therapy. And many of these practitioners report significant improvements in fertility, significant reductions in pain. So, you know, I'd love just to hear you speak to that and just that idea of, is there another option for those who don't want to necessarily go straight to surgery, but are experiencing either fertility challenges or extreme pain? Yeah. So doing just kind of the functional medicine and pelvic floor, pelvic physical therapy does include using my, um, visceral mobilization to the abdomen. Some phys physical therapists are trained in Arv Arvigo massage. All of us in pelvic PT do internal manual physical therapy of the pelvic floor, vaginally, rectally. So you absolutely, especially combining physical and manual pelvic therapies with kind of the functional medicine approach, can relieve the symptoms completely. I mean, I've seen that. Fertility is a little bit of a different animal that I don't think we have the data to say with any confidence. So, you know, if, if my daughter had endometriosis or suspected endometriosis, and it's very difficult at 13, 15, 17 to know how much you're going to care about your fertility. <laughs> In that case, the strongest data we have on fertility preservation is that earlier surgery is more fertility preserving. Now, if someone does not want to have surgery and they want to go essentially a combination of pelvic uh, manual therapy and, and functional medicine, they can relieve the symptoms and potentially they could improve their fertility because obviously any structural improvements, fascial mobility, better circulation, lowered inflammatory cytokines, lowered autoimmune antibodies, which are one of the big reasons. If when there was a recent study presented by Dr. Uh, Vidali, who's, who's out of New York City, and his clinic also does a lot of autoimmune infertility challenges. And, and I've referred a lot of patients to a physician up in, I believe it's, gosh, it's not Michigan, but it's somewhere in the Northern Midwest in the US. Uh, her name is Dr. Kwok Kim. So there's this perspective that sometimes infertility is related to a localized autoimmunity. And Dr. Vidali posted this data that he and Dr. Braverman, who unfortunately is no longer with us, but they found that removing the endometriosis lesions with good excision surgery very quickly post-op and for at least six to 12 months post-op lowered those autoimmune antibodies and improved fertility. So we don't have a ton of data, like there's certainly no data comparing 
endoexcision surgery, post-op, and autoimmune antibodies head-to-head with Arvigo massage therapy. So, because it's very difficult to do that kind of study, not to mention to get funding for something like Arvigo massage therapy (laughs) is going to be really tricky. And, And I don't doubt that there are some cases that visceral mobilization, especially if it's a structural problem with fallopian tubes or something like that, can directly inf- in improve fertility because we know that visceral pelvic and abdominal physical therapy can improve fertility in general. That is a bit of a personal conversation, but the best data we have is on excision surgery being the most fertility preserving and the earlier you do it. You know, I would probably from a practical standpoint 17 to 22 years old would be kind of when, if my own daughter was going through this, I would be considering having her assessed for a good excision surgery. Mm -hmm. It's such an interesting and important perspective. I think that it's just, I, I feel like I'm just at the stage of envisioning a world where there aren't all of these barriers to good research, where if a treatment modality isn't associated with surgery or medication, that it still would be given equal weight in terms of the funding so that we could really get answers. Because I feel like what I hear you saying is like, we need those answers. And at this point, we don't really have them. So if we go with the best data, this would be the solution, but we don't really have the answer. Right. We don't really have data, as far as I'm aware, on any kind of randomized controlled trial or head-to-head trial of our Vigo massage. And, you know, There's also the kind of third rail of endometriosis medications, whether they're neuromodulators like gabapentin or pain medication or hormone suppression. You know, the other thing is the reason that many people don't have an improvement using hormonal contraceptives or other estrogen suppression is back in 2018 in Belgium, a study was published where we now realized, so we used to think that all endometriosis lesions were like fed by estrogen. So kind of the alternative approach was like lower estrogen with more of a vegan food plan and support the liver to better metabolize estrogen and support the gut to better better metabolize and exogenous estrogens like you know exposure to plastics and tap water and things like that. Now that's all basically good other than potentially the vegan diet, but liver support, gut microbiome optimization, great. But we also now know when the histology was done on the lesions, not all of them have upregulated upregulation of the uh, estrogen receptor. Sometimes it's progesterone receptors. Sometimes it's both estrogen and progesterone, and sometimes it's neither. So it's sort of like breast cancer, right? Not all breast cancers are estrogen fed. And so suppression of estrogen, which, you know, was a big strategy, Lupron, which essentially puts people into medical menopause with severe side effects and other forms of estrogen suppression. We see that now with Orlesa is not, sometimes that's helpful, but we, there's no way to know unless you're doing histology on the lesions in the same woman, you could have lots of different kinds of lesions Um, And by then you've taken the lesion out, so it doesn't even matter, right? (laughs) So you have people on these drugs that essentially put them into a medical menopause more or less affecting their brain, their heart, cardiovascular system in general, metabolism, bones for the long term. And it's okay, you know, if that controls symptoms, which is why people get so fired up about this, they're like, I need my birth control because otherwise I'm in intense pain. I get that. But that's still not solving the problem. That's still suppressing the symptoms, which is really valuable if you're stuck in bed and can't live your life. Really valuable. 72% or more, maybe it was even 74% of women with endometriosis say their life goes off track. They literally can't finish school. They can't get a good job. They can't keep a job. So their life, if it's life giving to be able to take hormonal birth control and not suffer every month, so you have to keep quitting your job every two years, that's hugely important. And I understand why people fight tooth and nail for that. But even when we do that, you know, it's one thing to choose it deliberately, knowing all of these options and being like, okay, I'm going to do this for a period of time, or this is the choice that I've decided or whatever. 
It's another thing to at 12 or 13 when you've got period pain to be put on the pill and like never talk to again or put on or less or Lupron or some other kind of hormonal suppression. It's like, that is just not a, you don't stay on that until you're 50. That just doesn't make any sense. Or until you try to have a baby and then you can't get pregnant because nobody dealt with the underlying issue. Just popping into today's episode to invite you to join my Fertility Awareness Mastery online self-study program. If you're looking for an informative and comprehensive DIY option for learning fertility awareness, I've got you covered. This program is the most comprehensive fertility awareness self-study program available. And the best part is you can learn at your own pace in your living room for a fraction of the cost of one of my live coaching programs. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash mastery for details. That's fertilityfriday.com slash mastery. Now let's go ahead and jump back into today's episode. You just so eloquently put into words what I just keep saying. I, I've been doing, this is the sixth year of the podcast and I'm just, it's still the same thing, but it's from day one. <laughs> We're still here. And this is why I, I share about my own experience. Like, when I had, when I was, when I had my two babies at home, like I pushed them out and everything, uh-huh. I realized at that point that, yeah, like the first half of labor was not as bad as my period pain to the point that I didn't know I was in labor. Like, yeah. so that is, we live in a world where we're told as women that that level of pain is just par for the course and that's not okay. And what you said, I just feel the need to highlight it, which is that it's no one's saying that there's anything wrong with controlling the pain. I'm anti-pain. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. And no one should have to go through that. But as you said, it's, there's a difference between believing that that is the only possibility and understanding all of the possibilities, some of which could actually address the underlying condition or issue and resolve, heal, reverse that versus believing that the hormonal stuff or whatever is the only possibility. And I think that's really the message. And although it strikes a chord when you say things like, you know, it's giving you temporary relief, but it's not fixing anything. You know, women do often really, it just, of course, they're triggered by that because it's like, you're trying to take away the only thing that's ever helped me. It's like, no, 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 no. (laughs) I'm not trying to take it away. I'm trying to expand your awareness to the possibility that that could have actually been a temporary way. There's actually a way out. Yeah. And I think another reason to be fair, why that's so triggering is it's not really about you or I, it's about the fact that there is a war on women's reproductive autonomy. And so we aren't trying to take it away but any evidence we add to the discussion of it not being the be all end all gives people who are trying to take it away the ability to use that as fuel for their fire. And I think that's an important thing to acknowledge because I mean, definitely in the US, there's to this day, I mean, (laughs) despite the fact that we have a pandemic going on, there are literally people trying to stop the ability of hormonal birth control from being covered by any insurance or any access to abortion. You know, there's all of access to birth control for God's mm-hmm. sake. So I support think that's in like for birthing mothers, having support, multiple support people at their birth is being taken away right now. Yeah. And also putting those birth workers at risk by not expanding the thinking of how they can be working with patients. So if I'm a doula right now to go into a hospital in New York City, you're not the priority person for PPE. And clearly we have a huge problem with PPE right now in the US. And so you get kind of prioritized to the side. And so, you know, it's like the whole system makes it difficult for women to, we kind of pits women against each other 
fighting for straws rather than realizing that there's a place for all of this and we need to be fighting for all of it. You know, we need to be yes. fighting for birth support. We need to be fighting for birth workers to be safe. We need to be fighting for wide open access to hormonal birth control and even drugs that are hormonal suppressing for short-term pain relief. But we also need to be fighting for concurrently a conversation about the wider options, good surgeries, a functional medicine approach, pelvic physical therapy and other similar pelvic manual therapies. Because when, when it's like, don't talk about that because they might take it away, we can't have a good conversation about efficacy and to your point, really researching the risks and benefits of everything. Well, this is exactly, it's kind of touching back on what we were talking about with regards to period pain. Like the goal isn't less bad. We have to, <laughs> we have to really expand our imagination and our consciousness around what is possible. And I love what you said, because absolutely, I feel that we should have all of these options on the table, but don't put them on the table if you're not going to talk about the risks associated yeah. with them. Because my question often is, so I just, we're recording this, so when, when I publish it, it'll be in the, in the future, but at the time we're recording this, last week I released another episode of my Pill Reality series, and I interviewed a woman who had a stroke when she was in her early 20s. And so one of the things that I often think to myself, for women with severe endo symptoms pain who have been put on the pill because that's their only option, it's not to say that these women, because they're taking it for medical reasons, are somehow exempt from the potential side effects. You know, some women are on this because they have to be, and they may still be experiencing anxiety, depression, loss of libido. And some of them may have more of the severe side effects like pulmonary embolism and stroke. And so, again, there are women in this world who can't take estrogen containing birth control. Mm -hmm. And so if we're telling women with endo that this is the only way air quotes for them to address the pain, we are doing them a disservice. Again, we should have all of the options on the table, <laughs> all of the information so that we can really make informed decisions. And then we can elevate our consciousness to realize that like, we can do so much better for women. We deserve to, to be better. I feel like we deserve to be healthy and not in pain and to have real answers and real solutions to our health concerns. Yeah. And, and in the world of pelvic pain, even sometimes you're trading one problem for another because we know as a fact that hormonal birth control increases the risk of vulvodynia and sometimes permanently because it can elevate SHBG relatively permanently. Now, from and a just functional, quickly share what vulvodynia is. Vulvodynia is vulvar pain, basically. So people will have pain on insertion of tampons or specula of the uh, gynecologic exams, sex, of course. And so because sex hormone binding lobulin is elevated by hormonal birth control, that's basically what it does is kind of goes around and binds up your own sex hormones and then gives you a little bit back enough to be, to have some estrogen, but not enough to uh, reproduce, which is helpful sort of for certain things. But that is where we end up essentially suppressing estrogen, which will cause an earlier vulvovaginal atrophy. So it's your clitoris and your vulvar tissue can kind of shrink and atrophy, a lot of dryness, risk for chronic infections like yeast and BV, potentially risk from UTIs because you just kind of lose the pH can change and increase risk of vulvodynia, which is kind of any other vulvar pain cause. And so you're kind of trading one kind of pelvic pain for another. And for some women who are on hormonal birth control for as little as three months, the sex hormone binding globulin can be elevated permanently. Now, from a functional medicine standpoint, we do have some more tools that the kind of medical establishment doesn't really use on a regular basis for lowering a sex hormone binding globulin, but it, it can be difficult to do that. 
sometimes it's not as quickly as three months. Sometimes people come off the pill and their sex hormone binding globulin rebounds or will reduce, but that is not always the case. And genetically, there are different kinds of receptors. You know, some people need more estrogen for their receptors to be optimally stimulated and others need less. So we can't, and there isn't like a good screening of like, this is a person who would be good on birth control and this one's genetics isn't. We just don't have that level of granularity. So we're always doing this like trial and error situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did an interview with, with Mike Gaskins who wrote In the Name of the Pill. And so, I mean, he talks about the most severe consequences of this little experiment that we're doing, because since we don't have a way to screen who's going to be sensitive to estrogen, then what happens is everyone's put on the pill and a certain percentage of women are just going to have a stroke. A hundred percent. Like this is, I mean, this is the experiment. And then, and then my, like, I've been on this like pedestal, try to get off of it in a minute, but like <laughs> <laughs> my biggest thing with that is again, this isn't even necessarily a conversation about not putting women on the pill, but as a health practitioner who is prescribing, I feel that why is there not across the board mandated, just take five minutes, explain some of those symptoms that would be aligned with those risk factors, headaches, migraine with aura, pain in certain areas that you might be prone to uh, developing blood clots, et cetera. So that if you have those symptoms, you know, immediately to go to your doctor. That's all I ask. Yeah. Yeah. And I think also just awareness, you know, I posted on my Facebook, personal face, Facebook profile, like a couple months ago, we have to be mindful of hormone because my daughter's now 16. So a lot of her friends are just, they're getting put on the pill <laughs> for various things, you know, whether it's acne or just because of like, their mothers are like, okay, if we just put them on their pill and close our eyes, then we don't have to worry about if they're having sex, right? So, um, so the problem with that is in teenagers especially, it's not a huge number, but a percentage risk of suicide is significant. And nobody talks about that. And then, you know, again, there are warning signs. There are there's anxiety, there are mental health changes. And I work with so many clients with this, teenagers, college students, and it's constantly like they're being gaslit. They're, they're, it's like it's, this happens three months after they go on birth control and are sent off to college, which is two major changes, one physiologic and one psychosocial to just leave for college. Everything about that is, is a big change put on the birth control pill right before you go. And then there's this, you know, and then they come back with anxiety and it's like, oh, it wasn't the pill. Now let's put you on an antidepressant or change your pill. It wasn't the pill, but let's try a different one. <laughs> and this I see to this day all the time in very highly educated populations. And it drives me crazy because that makes no sense. If it was anything else, if like, any other thing had happened, and then three months later or less, you had a, some kind of sequela from that, it would be like, well, let's look at what was happening right around then or right before then and maybe change it. You know, if, if someone was put on high do dose vitamin D, they'd be like, it's probably the vitamin <laughs> oh my D. Gosh. Get, out, get off of it now. Yeah. <laughs> Go inside. Your vitamin D is too high. You know, <laughs> you took too much vitamin C or something like crazy like that. But hormonal birth control or like, you know, or opioids. It was fine. That was fine. <laughs> oh, such an important conversation. I mean, yeah, I, I won't, I feel like I'll, I'll kind of bring it back to endo because I can stay there all day, as you know. Yeah. yeah. But these are really important points. And this is the conversation. I mean, the challenge too, I think with our, our, the world that we live in is that we kind of live on sound bites and your average person is so busy with their lives that they're not spending two months researching, looking at the scientific information, even having a nuanced conversation like we're having today. Yeah. You know, if someone took uh, a, a sound bite out of our conversation, I'm sure you could find a great one for me that makes me sound like a, you know, pill hating crazy. But <laughs> taken out, yeah. out, you know, out of context. But if you actually listen to the full, you know, hour long conversation that we're having, we're hitting some really important 
points, which is that, yes, it can control pain management. Yes, we actually should be advocating for access. But yes, we need to have conversations about the side effects. And yes, like this is this is the whole point of like what I'm sure you do and what I do. Like this is the whole point. This is nuanced stuff. But I wanted to ask, and I think it's interesting because we've been talking for almost an hour, but we've been talking about endo. But I wanted to ask you to tell us what endo is. I mean, I've heard a number of different pieces of information. You know, you brought up, you know, many practitioners believe that it's estrogen sensitive. I've heard people say that there's an autoimmune component. I think, but I haven't personally looked at any research about this, that people have even talked about like infections or inflammation and dietary. And so what is endo? And from your understanding, and you also spoke about the genetic component, but what makes us susceptible? Like what is driving this? And one other thing I'll say is that I did a a really interesting interview a while back and it was talking about xenoestrogens and all of those uh, exposures. And the researcher I was talking about also mentioned how being exposed to certain toxins in utero at certain developmental points. So there's all of these aspects of what it is, what it like, so over to you. <laughs> yeah. So it's a complex disease that we don't know everything about, but there are three main kind of components. One, it is these physical lesions that are created from tissue that that are that is tissue if you look at the tissue tissue histology that is very similar to but not exactly the same as the tissue inside of the lining of the uterus now how does it kind of get there we we actually think that's embryologic so that's true the, when they look at female fetuses that did not survive for whatever reason i think it's 9% have endometriosis lesions and 10% of the people with uteruses population of cycling females have endometriosis, one in 10, right? Also transgender men. So we don't want to miss that. So it's established pre-birth, but there are inflammatory and autoimmune factors that can make it worse essentially, or activate it and hormonal factors. So there's this underlying genetic factor, then the symptoms begin to present in pre-puberty, eight, nine, 10 years old, 11 years old, where girls will, and it's often a lot easier to see this in retrospect or in the context of knowing that this is a, a heritable disease because It's very common at age 9, 10 to have IBS for whatever reason, stress, eating a lot of junk food at birthday parties, like who knows, right? And so usually the first battle is some kind of GI issue. And it's like, why is my seven-year-old or nine-year-old constantly bloated, has stomach pain, won't eat, but constipation, IBS, whatever. And then when the cycles begin, more of the period kind of pain begins, anxiety, fatigue, depression. And some of that is compounded by just the medical trauma of it all when someone's like, this is normal, you're fine, da, da, da. couldn't be this. So there's a lot of that. And, and so over time, that's sort of the progression. And again, the anxiety is related to some challenges with the digestion, which makes it hard to absorb the nutrients that feed the brain, essentially, to support uh, optimal mental health. But it's also related to the fact that anyone's going to be frustrated, depressed, anxious, fatigued, if they're battling a pretty significant pain battle and exhaustion battle day in and day out. And no one's really believing them, or if they are, they're kind of slapping them with medications that have a lot of side effects. So so essentially the disease itself has an underlying genetic factor. There, It's worsened by inflammation. So an anti-inflammatory food plan is very helpful, lowering, lowering exposures to xenoestrogens and other environmental hormones basically is very helpful. And then I really take from a nutrition approach and a lifestyle approach, autoimmune factors are definitely at play. There's a lot of overlap with Hashimoto's and other kind of subclinical autoimmune markers. We see that all the time. And so 
from a functional medicine standpoint, I'm not really looking to kind of whack-a-mole out the symptoms. We take a system by system approach. So don't chase symptoms, optimize systems is what I always say. And it's easiest, I think, to start with digestion and musculoskeletal, which is why I like to work collaboratively with physical therapists or other pelvic myofascial therapists, because calming that physical tension, people carry a lot of stress in their pelvic floor like they do in their neck is key, but then optimizing digestion first because the digestive and immune system are very intricately connected. So if we're dealing with inflammation, autoimmune factors, that's key. And then you can then kind of get the nutrients you need for the body to heal its own nervous system and endocrine system. So that's really the approach I take. And we have to also recognize that a large percentage of women with any pelvic pain condition have a history of sexual trauma or birth trauma, other kinds of trauma in their medical trauma in their early lives. And, and when that happens in childhood or the teenage years or around birth, in the nervous system, it's amplified and can kind of be pronounced longer, can kind of lower our resilience to stress. And I think of endometriosis as a biochemical stressor among other stressors. Mm. I think that everyone listening should just rewind this back and listen to what you said again. And I mean that, um, especially the women who are listening, who are, who tuned in because they have severe pain and they're looking for information and have never been believed and have been pushed aside. I honestly just re rewind it back about five minutes and listen again to what Jessica just said. I can't even underscore <laughs> the importance of that and how you brought in the underlying factors and the past trauma. And it, it feels, I mean, for me, when I was listening to just your explanation, it really resonated on a deeper level. And I think for me, one of the reasons why it resonated so deeply is because you're coming from essentially a place of love. It's like, I see you, I hear you, I understand you, and I want to care for you. <laughs> it's like the direct opposite of what we experience collectively uh, as women. And yeah, I did say that when we go to the doctor, for the most part. I'm not trying to undermine any individual doctors, but this is a system that we work, that they work within a system that wasn't designed to care for us in the ways that you've described. So the question that comes out of that is one of the biggest challenges in the work that I do is supporting women to find the, the care and the support that they need. And, and sometimes a big challenge there is that we've all been indoctrinated to believe that the doctor has all the answers. <laughs> and so often the, the biggest challenge is to get a woman to think, you know, we all need doctors, of course, we all need to have a really good family doctor. But I think one of the biggest challenges is often having that conversation around if you really want to get to the root cause, your MD isn't trained to do that. I don't know if you want to speak to that. And um, for the women who are listening, you know, who are like, okay, I'm on board. What do I do first? Yeah, so obviously, our organization, we are, we have a health coach program, a kind of you know, we work with health coaching and lifestyle medicine, functional nutrition to support this from the root cause. That's what our clinic does for women with endometriosis and pelvic pain in general. And we have a really strong network of doctors all over the place and pelvic health physical therapists and manual therapists who do all take that approach. And, and even pain management physicians because as we've talked about before, all of these things are just tools. They're, some are more politically charged than others, but there's a time and a place for every single one of these tools, as long as they're approached that way and aren't like, there's so much weak, so I don't want to go off on that. But at the end of the day, ultimately, you will be responsible for building your own team. The hard part about doing that when you're in intense, constant pain and you don't really know where to start I feel like that's what our clinic offers. I've, we have health coaches that I've trained for years, clinicians in functional medicine approach, and we essentially have a process of helping you start to take ownership of the things you can do day to day. You know, what time, what time you go to bed, what you eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, 
getting outside in the sunlight, your daily movement practice, your mindfulness practice. We help you navigate all the things that you can do. You have a lot of power in this that you actually may not know about yet. And then the second piece of what we do is help you build that team. And I have 25 years of experience in complex pelvic pain. So if you have endometriosis, you have vulvodynia, you have bladder pain syndrome, you have period pain, I've been speaking at conferences, professional conferences on this for more than a decade. So I know a lot of people who really do have that approach. Some of them work in fairly traditional medical settings. Others have more out-of-the-box practices. But most people who go into this, who are good, who stay for the long term, really do have our best interest at heart. It's just that we have to find them. And it's a little bit difficult to do that because it's not necessarily going to be the gynecologist down the street from you. Mm -hmm. well, I really appreciate you saying that because if I've learned anything from all these years of interviewing is that there are so many amazing practitioners everywhere, but you wouldn't necessarily know unless you look. And often they're in your backyard or mm -hmm. in the next town away. They're not on TV. <laughs> right. They're busy. <laughs> yeah, they're they're busy. actually working. Um, <laughs> but what's interesting is that there are so many. And what I found, it's something also that you touched on at some point in our conversation, but I think it's when you were talking about the, the surgeons and how this is a specialization. And one of the things I've been saying for years is that if anything, doing you know, all these interviews and speaking to so many different professionals is that when you find somebody like yourself who has devoted their practice to a specific type of care, when you need support in that area, that is the person to go to. Yeah. Because the they also know all the other good people. That's right. Yeah. And so for the listener, you know, if you can take anything from this, it's that there is support. And even in this crazy time, depending on when this episode is, coming out in 2020, you know, many of us are finding that we're really limited into who we can access. There's still many practitioners who do work virtually. And so, you know, help is available. And what you said is key. It may be difficult to find it because it may not be the doctor right down the road, but they're out there. So there's hope. Absolutely. <laughs> so as we bring our interview to a close, is there, and we've, you know, we've really gone through so much. This interview is so informative and I'm really excited to share it, but you know, is there one kind of thought that you want to leave the listeners with today? Yeah, I think the most important thing you can start with, because people often come to me with on kind of on very restrictive plans and very worried about exactly what to eat and things like that, what to do is one of the most nourishing things you can do for yourself starting right now is when you get up in the morning, expose yourself outside, if at all possible, or at least through an open window, to 15 minutes of light and drink something comforting. Do that every morning as a way to start your day and the rest of it we can support you with. Ah, I love that. Doesn't that feel good? <laughs> One of the topics that I, like, I'm not going to, but one of the topics that came up, the thought that came up was that, and it just keeps coming up in all these interviews is really to trust your intuition, to tune into what feels good. Unfortunately, we're in a system where we're being gaslighted and we're, you know, you feel a certain way and you go to someone who says, oh no, it's in your head. And I think if anything, these challenges bring us back to like, oh, that feels good. This resonates yeah. with me. We really got to tune into that. Yeah. Oh, Jessica Drummond, thank you so much for coming on the show. I just loved our conversation. I could honestly stay in this conversation all day. I'm so thankful for the work that you do. And I just love knowing that you're out there, not only doing this work, but training professionals all the time. You're yeah. making the world a much better place for you to eye everywhere. <laughs> thank you. And can I give everyone who's listening a free copy of our, of the new book? Of course. Yeah. So if you go to outsmartendo.com, you can download a free copy of the book and that kind of lays out step by step. If you want to just start taking ownership of this yourself, it's essentially our process step by step in uh, the most clear way I think I could put it on paper. So outsmartendo.com, you can go grab your free book. That is amazing. Uh, so I'll definitely put the link uh, for Outsmart, OutsmartingEndo.com. It's out, OutsmartEndo.com. 
Okay, thank you. Outsmartendo.com. So we'll definitely put the link for anyone who's listening on the go. And would you like to share any additional information for how the listeners can reach you and also reach out specifically, uh, as we were talking about before, for support? Yeah, so our main website is integrativewomenshealthinstitute.com. And I'm also on Instagram at Integrative Women's Health. And so if you have any questions, you can DM me over there, find us, explore our website at the main site. Well, thank you again for being on the show and sharing your expertise. This has been amazing. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode over at fertilityfriday.com 422. I hope that you enjoyed today's episode with Jessica. I found it to be extremely informative and a really great overview of the variety of challenges in terms of getting an accurate diagnosis, having your practitioner take you seriously, and also the challenge of treatment because there is a bit of a limitation of treatment from the medical perspective. Typically, we're looking at drugs, surgery, and the option when it comes to the medical system. And for many women, they find relief through a combination of natural means, dietary changes, um, reducing inflammation, a variety of targeted supplements. And at the end of the day, it is possible to see improvements and experience a reduction, significant reduction in your pain, and also to address fertility challenges in some cases. It doesn't always require surgery, but it does require a lot of diligence. And if you're choosing away from the medical system, then it does put a lot of pressure on you to really be out there finding a functional practitioner who can support you with alternative methods. And it's just not an easy path. So hopefully today's episode shed some light you know, shared some important information and potentially inspires and motivates you to seek out the support you really need if you are struggling with severe period pain or you suspect you have endometriosis for another reason. And I think it's always important to just mention, of course, that there are situations where a woman may have endometriosis, even severe endometriosis with no pain, depending on where the lesions are. And often the sign of endometriosis in cases like that is infertility that is, quote, unexplained. So it's a really important and complicated issue. And there's lots of different ways it can present. And although it poses many challenges for women to get the treatment and care that they need, at the end of the day, there is hope. And it's really up to us to take the reins, take our health into our own hands. Because after all, nobody cares as much about your own health as you do. So with that said, I hope you have a wonderful week weekend whenever you're tuning into the show. And of course, as always, until next time, be well and happy charting.